After a period of rule by the Mongols, the humiliated Han, the largest ethnic group in China, regrouped and reasserted the rule of Confucius. What followed was an improbable final dynasty that, from humble beginnings as a proto-state, came to dominate the territory we know as China today, before the forces of modernity turned autocratic rule into a relic. Hello, my name's Guy, and welcome to the last episode in our series that deals with dynastic China. From here on in, the pace of change accelerates as we move through periods of rapid industrial development and the colonialist zeal that forced China's transformation from an imperial supremo to humiliated puppet of faraway powers. The roles reversed so quickly and so dramatically that the Chinese couldn't see the wave of change even as it swept over them. After the turmoil of the departing Yuan dynasty, when the Mongols ruled China, came a refreshing period of solid government and social stability. Rather than tighten their grip on the people, administrators worked towards the decentralization of relations. Communities were to be self-sufficient, and their farm workers ready to be called up on a rotational basis as a sort of reserve force. It was a system called Wei Shuao. It worked well, and certainly reduced the military payroll, until the inevitable wars at the end of the Ming period that demanded a standing army. The progressive force behind the early Ming was the White Lotus Movement, which had a Buddhist ethic. Its followers wore a trademark red turban, and they were the liberals of the day. Carrying on from the Song dynasty's success in military innovation, the Ming won their decisive battle against the outgoing Yuan on Lake Poyang in 1363. It was a mighty naval skirmish where, though the rebel forces were vastly outnumbered by perhaps three or four times, luck and firepower sealed the outcome. This was firepower of the old sort, with burning ships sent among the enemy fleet to scatter the lines and set fire to craft whose draft limited agility. Relations with Tibet were fractious. On the one hand, there were spiritual leaders in the country whose teachings were particularly respected in China in the mid-16th century. One especially revered scholar was Wang Yang Ming, but he was attacked by conservatives for his Buddhist bias that flew too fiercely in the face of classic Confucianism. He advocated experience over book learning, saying that anyone could be great with the right combination of sense and application. But China continued to oppress Tibet. It was a policy only kept in check by trade. China needed Tibet's horses, and Tibet had a taste for China's tea. It was not just at borders that problems emerged. The eunuchs, long emasculated in more ways than one, built up a sort of parallel administration and ran politics behind the scenes in the court of the Wanli Emperor. And then both Japan and Portugal pulled silver from international trade. Silver was China's currency, and the sudden stop caused massive inflation and a sort of liquidity crisis as people began hoarding their reserves. As if things couldn't get any worse, the Little Ice Age, a period of extraordinary weather that brought drought in the summer and extreme cold in the winter, destroyed agriculture. There was an epidemic and, to top it all off, an earthquake that is recorded as the worst in world history. In 1556, nearly a million people were crushed in the cave dwellings they inhabited at the time. The new Qing dynasty started as a proto-state called Manchuria. This was a multiracial mix of tribes in northern China, backed by the Mongols who had ruled China as the Yuan dynasty a few centuries before. These amassed tribes dealt humiliation to the ethnic Han, forcing them to adopt the classic Qing coiffure, shaved head with a topknot, also known as the Peking pineapple. It was conceived as a sign of loyalty by the rulers, but angered those who saw the decree as a corruption of Confucian ideals of hierarchy. The two emperors who epitomized the era were the Yongzheng and his son, Qianlong. They were early modern state makers with an eye for foreign relations with Imperial Russia and other states that lasted into the 19th century. The Treaty of Kayakta in 1727 opened up a trade link that exchanged Russian furs for Chinese tea. In the 18th century, European powers launched expansionist pushes across the world. It was the British East India Company that sent a delegation to China in 1793 under Lord George McCartney. In spite of their best efforts, the Chinese were not to be persuaded of the value of opening up their borders. Chan Long told McCartney, The kings of myriad nations come by land and sea with all sorts of precious things, and consequently, there is nothing we lack. The point is that there could have been so much more. So the Canton system stayed in place. Canton was a southern Chinese port designated as the one place where trade can be conducted with Western powers. It was an attempt to keep foreigners out of China as far as possible, and it worked to a degree. Hong merchants, as they were known, represented a state monopoly run from the so-called Ocean Trading House. All merchants had to report to this excise building on anchoring, 
and the fixed prices led to a racket that made competition almost impossible. Traders became more and more desperate. Concurrently, the Chinese became more and more suspicious, ushering in a period of xenophobia that would plague Chinese relations until the collapse of the Qing in the early 20th century. Foreigners became known as barbarians. Chinese nationals were forbidden to enter into any sort of trade relation with their putative oppressors, including money lending. As soon as any foreigner set foot on Chinese soil, they were watched mercilessly. This paranoia smacked of the same mistrust that was beginning to split China itself. Many commentators attribute this to the multi-ethnic beginnings of the Qing, when it was formed by the Yurchen people in the distinct minority. Though the Yurchen and their later state of Manchuria were successful in bringing together disparate groups, they still marked people apart. Army units ran the so-called banner system, where the colour of the troop indicated the race of the soldiers. In their keenness to categorise and distinguish good from bad, the Qing also began to pass judgement on members of society. This is quite unbelievable when you remember the enlightened statesmanship of Emperors Yong Zhang and Qianlong. Now, scholars, farmers, artisans and merchants were deemed worthy. Slaves, servants and entertainers were cast aside as ignoble. Quite clearly, views had departed from the Buddhist leanings of the early period of the dynasty and moved quite definitely in the direction of conservative Confucianism. China had for so long been the world's polymath. Technical innovation, progressive social and political policies, blends of complementary philosophy, these were all characteristics of the dynastic superpower. China lost the lead when gunpowder found its way to Europe, which coincided with an era not only of military development at a pace that outstripped China's engineers, but also exploratory zeal that never caught on in China. Foreign adventure only interested the Chinese at their borders, which is why they themselves never became a great colonial power on a global scale. Colonies opened up new trade routes and a need for new economic structures that Chinese rulers were either not prepared to see or not prepared to accept. China was for a long time a world leader in military technology, but the colonial powers were quick to overtake Chinese weaponry after the invention of gunpowder. You can find out more about this in a special episode on the topic by clicking here. In the meantime, have a think back over the episodes on China's dynastic past we have published up to now. Do you see any common themes? Did any dynasty learn from the mistakes of its predecessors? Let us know your thoughts and leave any comments and ideas in the section below. My name's Guy. Thanks for stopping by. See you next time.